Uh, hello and welcome uh, to our mid-year review of the global power generation spending market outlook. Uh, I think now is obviously a very timely uh, period to look at the, uh, take a fresh look at that, uh, uh, those spending numbers. We've obviously reached a point where we may now be seeing, um, I guess, some degree of improvement in the broader market as countries start to emerge and come out of lockdown. And, and this obviously may start to ease some of the stresses that we've um, seen and reported on uh, associated with project activity. So this may is obviously a very good time now, I think, to retrim and reset one's sales, really to try and capture some of the uptick in project activity uh, that's now starting to move forward. Uh, and to help us do that, I'm delighted to be joined by our Vice President of Global Power Research, Britt Burt. Britt is based in our Texas head office and has close to 30 years of experience uh, in researching the power markets globally. But before we do that uh, and get stuck into the numbers, I'd just like to say obviously a very big thank you to our webinar uh, sponsors today, Hilco Filtration Systems. Hilco are a division of the Hilliard Corporation. Uh, they are a global provider of motion control and filtration products to the oil and gas and refining and the power sectors, to name but a few. So uh, just really just to, 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 to set the scene very quickly uh, and to take a, a look at the total global view of active capital projects that are either at the planning or the engineering stage. And uh, these numbers also include the maintenance and out, uh, outages that are planned going forward. Now, what we're currently tracking, as you can see, is 51,000 planned projects worth, worth just a sliver over 5.57 trillion. Uh, trillion globally. Uh, and as we can see, the two, three big economies, that's Europe, US, and Canada, account for about 30% of what's currently active and planned for uh, at the moment. Uh, and then we see that big sort of swathe of, of Asian bloc countries that accounts for about 60% of the spending. So, Britt, if we may, uh, just before we actually dig into this, the, the, the numbers themselves, the spending project numbers themselves, I thought we'd just take a little look um, at projects that have already kicked off, which as we can see here, stands at around 1.36 trillion globally uh, currently, which is about 20% increase on the numbers that Brit and I presented about seven months ago, back in November when we did this webinar. Now, um, obviously that is a lot of uptick um, on the numbers that we presented. So Brit, really, I'd just like to ask you, um, how has the COVID-19 crisis sort of affected projects that are already underway? Uh, and do you think as we go through this year that we can see a continuation of this level of project activity kicking off? Yeah, globally, um, globally we've uh, confirmed or identified uh, a little over 400 projects and about $80 billion that has had some type of of impact from the uh, COVID outbreak. Uh, mostly it has been wind and solar projects. Uh, I would think solar is a little bit, uh, has been a little bit more heavily affected than, than wind. Um, and that's been because of some supply chain disruptions, uh, uh, curtailments to the available labor force for these projects and things of this nature. Uh, geographically, it's been in places most heavily hit have been like South America, uh, uh, East Asia, the U.S., uh, South Asia, and uh, it's it's been more commonly uh, happening with grassroots projects, new build uh, plants, as well as unit additions and things such as that. So it, it really hasn't had as big of an impact on the end plant capital projects, but it's been a lot of the grassroots activity, the ones that have the, the greatest number of workers. Great. Thanks, Brett. Now, um, as I said, before we get into where new CAPE CAPEX is being directed, I thought we would, could just take a look at what the global installed base looks like at the moment. And this is based on um, the operational units that we're tracking globally, uh, and as we can see, four geographies pretty much dominate the installed base, and, and is really what we'd expect to see um, 
off that combination of having very large populations and or industrial and manufacturing density. Uh, and interestingly, what we can still see in the installed base is still a fair amount of coal making a, uh, a contribution to the existing fuel mix at the moment. So it's a fair, fair share of the contribution at present. Now, um, Brit, as we move into the new build, um, and, and again, looking at the unit level, how is the fuel mix now playing out? Uh, and have current market conditions affected the previous transition towards renewables? Yeah, we're, we're still on a, uh, on a march toward renewable energy. Uh, when I look at everything that, we're, that we have under construction right now, somewhere on the order of about 700 uh, gigawatts, uh, about 330 gigawatts of that is renewable energy. Now, there's still some pockets of coal being built. Uh, when, I, when I look at coal, uh, you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday. When I look at coal, I see 168 gigawatts that are under construction right now. And it's in places where you would, you would expect it to be. It's in China. Uh, South Asia, like India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, um, and in um, and Indonesia, so Southeast Asia and Vietnam. When I look a little bit further out at things that are under development, 65% uh, of everything that we're tracking capacity-wise is renewable energy, primarily uh, solar, wind, some hydro mixed in there, some pockets of geothermal. Uh, but still, when I look at uh, natural gas, uh, you know, about 16% of everything that's under development is natural gas fired capacity, and still some coal there, about 13% of the total capacity that's under development is coal fired generation. So, um, clearly some continued momentum, um, but what I would like to do now is really just stop just for a second. I think we have a poll question which is going to be shown to you folks. Uh, and I'm going to read what the question is and then uh, explain some of the, the, the options. The question is, what emerging technologies uh, and evolving technologies will have the biggest impact on global markets in the next 10 years? And some of those options are battery storage, uh, second option, other forms of energy storage, uh, and then the power to X. Also, we have microgrids and off-grid systems, which are obviously uh, driving a lot of momentum associated with uh, you know, the T and D space, uh, and then there's the other. So uh, we're going to give you a few seconds now to uh, decide and land upon your answer, and then I think we're going to be showing you the results. Now, Britt, maybe you could read through what the results are if you see them, and just talk a few seconds around some of the things that you're seeing. Yeah, I, I agree with the uh, with the majority here. Uh, battery storage, we're we're seeing uh, that take hold more and more. Uh, we're we're tracking uh, globally. I, I believe we're up to about thirty forty billion dollars worth of battery storage activity, and that's included in some of the numbers we're talking about today. Uh, I, I think that's definitely going to play a big impact. Microgrid and off grid systems, I agree with that as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm totally in tune with what what the majority says here. In agreement, I should say. That's great. Thanks, Britt. Now um, we know, Britt, that you and your team have been uh, working really at full pace, uh, certainly over the last couple of months, really to go back and revisit and check project statuses of currently active projects. Can you just give us a broad brush? You know, your synopsis, your observations of, of what you and the researchers are actually seeing at the moment. What are some of the challenges that the, the, the recent COVID impact has thrown up for projects, project owners? And then how have those project owners responded? Yeah, well, uh, the, the biggest impact, obviously, has been the uh, sharp decline in, in electricity, uh, in demand for electricity. Uh, and that's, that's been global. And depending on where you are, it varies in how big of an impact that's had. If I look in parts of South America, demand's been down 30%. If I look in the United States, it's been around 6 to 7%. Europe, uh, you know, Spain, Italy, some of those places, 17%, 15%. So we've seen sharp demand decreases across all sectors, uh, 
industrial, residential, commercial. Um, so that has led to some projects being delayed and pushed out. I really haven't seen a, uh, cancellations on a grand scale, but I have seen a lot of delays and things that have been pushed out until later this year, and in some cases uh, into next year. Uh, of course, supply, I mentioned supply chain disruptions for solar earlier, and that's for regions that uh, you know are, are getting a lot of the components out of China and South Korea mainly, um, and that's affected solar more than it has anything else. Um, this has happened here. It's happened in Africa. Um, it, it goes a little bit beyond that in Africa and some of the other places because they get some of their uh, components even for some of the hydro projects and natural gas fired projects from China. So um, I, all indications are here uh, that electricity demand is going to go back to up to our, you know, our mundane 1% growth in the United States and I think it's going to creep back across the world uh, as, as we move forward. We're seeing outages being delayed somewhat, non-essential uh, work, uh, the uh, work to the outage work, the schedule maintenance work to the base load units has pretty much progressed as planned, but the uh, uh, non essential work to gas turbines and things like that have been pushed out to next year. So I think it's still continuing what the full impact, it's still continuing to unfold a little bit. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we think that electricity in the United States is going to be down by about 5% this year, by the end of the year. Uh, and, and we're expecting similar uh, downturns, you know, across the globe. And uh, so it, it's certainly continuing to play out. It's still a fluid situation, but there have been some sharp, uh, you know, effects on the industry. Okay. Thanks, Brett. Now, we're going to be moving into uh, our first uh, market region, mm -hmm. uh, and that is North America, uh, and obviously your home territory. Um, obviously, as you said, a, a market which is experiencing very low levels of electricity demand growth. Um, have we seen any seismic or, or, or sort of big changes or impacts from the COVID uh, you know, pandemic. Uh, and by that, I, I'd like to just focus in on, has there been any kind of government or federal level stimulus or initiatives put in place to kind of keep, keep, keep the project market ticking along? Uh, no, and I mean, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, you know, government incentive are the tax credits. And that's, that's the big question right now is, that, yeah, we had extended tax credits until the end of this year, uh, developers of wind power uh, had until the end of this year to uh, invest at least 5% of that project. The production tax credit has not been extended, nor has the investment tax credit for solar. What has happened is IRS stepped in and added a year to the safe harbor uh, provisions uh, for wind developers. So rather than uh, being required to, to have their wind capacity online and operating at the end of this year to get the full tax credit, uh, that's been extended out about a, a year. So that's the only thing that we've seen from that aspect. Tax credits, will they be extended for another year? I'm not certain. Um, I kind of have a feeling that they may be if we see another round of stimulus passed. Uh, it was added to the last package, but it just did not make it into the final bill. So, um, but I think we're going to bounce back from this. I mean, we, we're seeing projects that are moving full steam ahead. We've seen some uh, major natural gas fired projects that have been delayed a little bit uh, and pushed out. But um, I, I have all indications that things are going to pick, start picking up towards the latter half of this year. Okay. Now, Britt, heading south, uh, down into South America, and we, we also include Mexico, I think, in these numbers, and certainly a part of the world that has seen, uh, I guess, a number of years, uh, you know, struggling, really struggling with, you know, recession or near recessionary pressures. We've had you know, currency devaluations, we've got financial uncertainty across many countries uh, in South America. And now, obviously, we layer on top of that the kind of COVID-19. 
Are we expecting to see any of that sort of $175 billion that's, that's being planned? I mean, will we see any of it moving forward, you think? And if so, where? Well, uh, out of that $175 billion that you see there, the grand total, there's $31 billion of it that we rank. And you see I have the projects broken down by high, medium, and low probability. And that really represents the, the high probability of the projects that we have every indication to believe that they're going to move forward. Um, out of that $175 billion, uh, $31 billion of that is high probability projects. The vast majority of that is in Brazil and Mexico. Uh, so uh, uh, kind of slow to, to go forward in, in other parts, but uh, uh, Brazil and Mexico, uh, Brazil's moving forward with, uh, or had been moving forward with some of their PPA auctions for renewable energy. Now that's been delayed some because of the COVID um, uh, outbreak. Uh, but uh, aggressive plans to move forward re with renewable energy there, and then both Mexico and Brazil, uh, some opportunities for natural gas fire development as well. Um, outside that, Chile is doing away with their uh, uh, coal-fired generation. That's going to be replaced with renewable energy and, and other forms uh, of energy. So uh, it... it Yes, there's activity moving forward, but it remains to be very slow for the reasons that you just mentioned. Um, but uh, we, when I compare to what we've seen over the past year, two years, we've seen activity in South America creep up year over year and what actually kicks off. So. Mm. Now across to uh, Europe, uh, obviously a very similar market, so to speak, to the U.S., and that we've seen, obviously, you know, relatively flat electricity demand growth, uh, high electricity penetration rates. So, uh, and, and, and I guess the majority or a big bulk of that grassroots development uh, is going ahead to assist, again, the region, uh, you know, achieve its fuel mix transition to those uh, lower carbon sources. Now, with this as the trend, and obviously, you know, when I looked at the numbers again, obviously ample long-term supply in the global markets of gas and LNG is really starting to come through. Why are we not seeing more gas-fired capacity being developed in Europe? Well, we have uh, right now, when I look at everything that's under construction, uh, we've got 170 gigawatts or more that's under construction in terms of natural gas-fired capacity. When I look at everything that is in development, there's another 55 gigawatts of natural gas fired capacity. So we are seeing some development, um, and it's in places like the UK, Italy, France, uh, Spain, Poland, Germany, certainly Germany. Um, you're right when you compare it to renewables, especially wind, uh, it, it looks small, but there's still respectable investment there. And uh, the renewables, uh, you know, they, a lot of that is offshore wind, and that's continuing to, to gain traction, and there's more and more of it being built. And let's face it, they're on a course to, you know, get uh, in some places up to 80% of their electricity from renewables by 2050. So uh, that doesn't include natural gas. So. Right, right. Now, moving across to the, I guess, the broader Western Asian region, I think we include Turkey in these numbers as well. Uh, and that's obviously a, a, a market very well defined by, um, you know, a fast paced electricity demand growth profile. So uh, all, all pretty positive for the long term. Uh, now, we have seen, uh, you know, discussions and we've been tracking projects for a long time, talking about adding more renewables to the mix. Um, but obviously, we can also now see a lot of that still sitting in the pipeline. It hasn't really moved forward. Uh, do you think that this will ever move forward in, in any kind of you know, size, I guess, or will it be held back in favor of gas-fired development? Yeah, I, I, it, it's hard to me say, uh, you know, to say, will it never move forward? I, it's certainly slow to move forward when I look at the overall picture. Uh, you're right, we're tracking 48 gigawatts of new capacity that's under development for the region. 
and out of that, uh, 26 of that is uh, is natural gas. 10 gigawatts of it is nuclear, and about six gigawatts of it is is renewable energy. So it's absolutely slow to move forward. When I look at the pipeline, what's being developed and what what's moving forward. Um, you know, the the amount of renewable energy far surpass well, it, it surpasses natural gas fire capacity. Uh, 65 gigawatts of uh, renewables under development for the region, about 50 gigawatts of natural gas fire capacity uh, in development. Uh, some of these countries have very aggressive uh, goals and plans to move forward with renewable energy. Uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, um, uh, uh, others, uh, Kuwait, and, and others. And I think, uh, yes, I think eventually we're going to see more and more of that uh, break loose and move to development. It's just not because of the availability of natural gas it's been slow uh, to move forward. We talk about Turkey. Um, you know, natural gas really isn't a big option for them. So they're still, they're moving towards renewable, but they still depend heavily on coal. That That's still a, a big portion of their uh, fuel mix there, and uh, and of course we've seen a lot of nuclear uh, developed in the region as well, and I think that's going to continue as, as we move forward. Okay. Now heading across to uh, Africa, obviously a market rich with a, a very wide range of uh, localized natural resources, but again this isn't one of those other markets I think where we've seen historically very sluggish. Uh, rates of project realization, meaning you know projects coming from planning, engineering through to construction starts. Um, you know, does has the has the short term or even the mid term outlook altered, or are we still seeing a fairly sluggish market? Yeah, it it remains sluggish. I mean, a lot of plans, a lot of a lot of opportunity there, but from a there's just so many challenges. There's there's challenges from. Um, uh, from the economic standpoint, is the the, the biggest uh, thing. Uh, ESCOM in South Africa uh, continues to try to restructure uh, the industry and and are facing uh, financial hurt, hurdles. Uh, Nigeria, uh, a lot of opportunity there. There's need for uh, additional electricity there, but the infrastructure uh, the infrastructure is is crumbling and they do not have the, the money to come in. Now, they have gone into partnership with Siemens to rebuild and, and, um, and you know, revitalize their infrastructure and some of their, uh, some of their uh, generation assets and things of that nature, but it has been moved, uh, uh, slow to move forward. No matter where you go, any country on that list there and even the ones that aren't listed, uh, very aggressive plans for wind and solar development, um, some coal-fired development, certainly natural gas. When you look at uh, uh, Ghana, you know, there's opportunities for natural gas development. Uh, when you look at Ethiopia, uh, opportunities for solar and geothermal uh, development, and then wind across the continent. So uh, a lot of opportunity, but uh, you put it mildly when you say it's very sluggish and very slow to come together, and it remains to be so. Okay. Well, let's take another look at one of those big block countries where we see really quite you know, sizable planned spending uh, and, and into South Asia, which primarily, you know, the big spender there is India, as we can see. Now, again, that's been a market that has traditionally been very long coal, both in terms of, I guess, its feedstock and uh, as well as the installed uh, you know, installed capacity. Now, we constantly see commentary about very high levels of um, you know, air pollution across many of the major cities. Um, so how, with, with that kind of as the backdrop, lots of coal, lots of pollution, are we actually now set, starting to see momentum in adjusting the future generation mix? Is that starting to play out? It is mainly from a standpoint of uh, uh, adding additional solar capacity and adding uh, additional uh, capacity from small hydro, specifically in India, when I when I say that, but they're they're still heavily dependent and reliant on coal. And I'd, I'd, uh, as we've talked about before, I never 
I, I don't see that in the near term going away. I think uh, uh, the, the fuel availability is there. They run into a lot of infrastructure issues as well in terms of building new capacity. The, uh, the transmission uh, lines to support uh, new capacity, whether it's solar or wind or coal, uh, they, they face a lot of challenges there. Uh, Pakistan uh, has been meeting uh, a very robust growth in demand through building coal and uh, renewable uh, projects, and I think that's going to continue to, uh, to move forward. Bangladesh has aggressive uh, plans to electrify the whole country to make electricity available to everyone. That's slow to take place. I think the goal is 2025. Uh, but they're looking at uh, you know pretty pretty sizable investments there. So uh, it's another region where demand for electricity isn't the problem. There's just a lot of other challenges, whether it's financial, whether it's uh, 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 environmental uh, regulations or infrastructure uh, constraints that uh, just just kind of keep things at a, a very slow pace in terms of moving forward. Okay. Now into uh, East Asia, what we've done here is we've actually stripped out uh, China from this part of the analysis simply because it, it just simply dwarfs all the other countries. Now, when I reviewed the data uh, recently, I've, I've kind of it prompted two questions for me. First one is why is Japan actually sitting with such a high proportion of low probability projects? Uh, and again, with global supply gas fairly abundant, um, why are we seeing, you know, what I would say, relatively limited number uh, volumes of, of, of gas-fired capacity spending as well? Mm -hmm. Well, as far as the low probability projects, I think it's just, uh, uh, again, sometimes projects are, are taking a little bit uh, longer to come to fruition, and there's uh, maybe a, uh, an over uh, abundance of, of caution on some of those, a lot of renewable energy there. Natural gas, I think we're going to continue to see that gain traction. Uh, it's not, you're, you're right in saying that, uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really play a large role right now, but I think in Japan and South Korea, we're going to continue to see it uh, play a larger role, natural gas fire capacity, as well as in Taiwan. Um, um, so I, I, I believe we'll see that gain more and more traction as we go forward. Uh, but a lot of opportunity there for wind and solar. Uh, these smaller uh, hydro developments and pump storage uh, in Japan too are uh, uh, playing playing a role in in supplying uh, some of the electricity. That's a little bit further out, but uh, it's uh, it it certainly plays into that as well as biogas uh, projects and biomass projects that falls under that other column down at the bottom there uh, of energy source. So uh, we've, we've seen a, a good mixture of everything kind of come together uh, for that region. Now into the other uh, half or portion of East Asia, and this is just a slide specific to China, obviously a major focus on renewables we can see there. now. I guess it could be an obvious question or, or, or one that's easily answered. What is driving the, the big build out in solar and wind? Is it that they have such depth and scale in terms of solar and wind equipment and technology supply chains? Or is it because uh, other than coal, they, they, they just simply lack localized gas, for example? Yeah, it, it, it's a mixture of all of the above. I mean, they certainly have the technology and the uh, equipment, uh, you know, production to uh, support wind and solar uh, projects. Um, a lot of a lot of the wind is moving more to the uh, offshore uh, wind developments as opposed to onshore wind developments. Uh, so solar has. Uh, has actually slowed down a little bit in China. Uh, hydro developments are continuing to uh, uh, to pick up and gain traction, as well as uh, pump storage hydro. We're seeing more and more of that uh, in China. Uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, we're we're 
still going to see a considerable amount of coal uh, fired capacity that moves forward there. Uh, it's just, uh, I, I don't think it's something that's ever, ever really going to be going completely away. We've seen more nuclear capacity move forward. There was a lot of that that had been shelled for some time, and, and more of that is taking off gradually, but we're seeing more of that taking off. As far as gas, it's a matter of not having the uh, availability of natural gas. A lot of that's uh, dependent on LNG, and I, I think we'll see that gain more traction as, we're, as we move down the road. So, Britt, into our second to uh, last slide and uh, moving to uh, Southeast Asia. Now, uh, again, a heavy focus on adding, as we can see there with those grassroots numbers, uh, on adding new electricity provision, about 86% of, of that spend that we can see there is associated with grassroots development. But interestingly, we also see um, that this is certainly a part of the world that is still developing new coal-fired capacity. Why, why is that? It's because of the availability uh, of, of the fuel itself at an affordable price. So uh, it, it just makes sense. And every country in the region continues to uh, uh, set forth plans to move more away from coal-fired generation. Um, any any country on the list there is looking at uh, develop depending on where you are is developing wind certainly in Vietnam uh, wind solar uh, but they they have uh, high availability of coal at a very affordable price so it makes sense to use coal as well uh, the Philippines uh, it's uh, solar it's geothermal it's it's wind. Um, but again, they have been slow to move away from uh, coal-fired uh, facilities, as has been uh, Indonesia. So the answer to your question is because the, the availability of coal is there uh, at an affordable price, and I think we're going to continue to see that be the case uh, in, in terms of where their uh, fuel mix comes from uh, uh, for the future. Uh, we're seeing more uh, battery storage uh, projects uh, there. Uh, we're seeing a major transmission line uh, to Singapore uh, that uh, is, is coming over from Australia to import uh, electricity. So it's, it's a high mix of everything uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, but coal remains a big part of what they're doing there. Okay, thanks, Britt. Now, um, whilst you're going to be talking or, or just picking out a few themes or, or, or things that you need to be telling the audience on, on, on this slide, I know we've, we've grouped a number of market regions together. I'm going to be uh, preparing now just to, to, to put a few questions that have been coming over the web uh, to you. So uh, final slide, final market regions. Uh, what, what are some of the messages here about these three blocks? Yeah, uh, uh, Oceania mainly is, uh, includes Australia and, and New Zealand. Um, you know, their, their uh, development of uh, wind and solar has, has really uh, picked back up uh, in certainly Australia. Uh, it had been kind of shelved for a while, but it's coming back to, uh, to life. Um, and I, we're seeing some of the power, we'll talk about it in just a moment, but I'm seeing development of some of the Power to X projects in Australia as well. I think we're going to continue to see that uh, play a role. Uh, Central Asia, uh, it's really the stands countries, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, uh, that, that whole region. Um, still respectable investment there and uh, a lot of uh, push to develop more natural gas fired capacity and repower uh, older assets uh, with natural gas fired uh, uh, generation. Coal still plays a role there, but uh, you know, movement more towards renewable energy. As far as Russia goes, uh, we kind of split that out uh, because they, they go across two continents there. So we, we split it out as an individual region. Uh, coal continues to play a major role of what they uh, are getting their uh, their electricity mix from, but uh, 
a, a respectable amount of investment in natural gas uh, fired capacity. Um, new hydro developments as well as rehabilitating some of their existing facilities and uh, so I just kind of wanted to uh, briefly touch on those three regions because sometimes we don't go into those. Yeah no it's useful useful to do. Now uh, just shifting gear a little bit before we come into this last slide and, and talk about uh, you know captive power. Can you just talk to us you know some of the key themes that are occurring within the, uh, the gen sets and the power provision within the industrial markets. Yeah, I, and I, I, you know, it's something that we often don't go into too deep. But um, you know, we uh, we do track these projects at the industrial site. So it may be a refinery or a chemical plant or a food and beverage plant that has on-site power generation. Uh, we're tracking all types of projects here, uh, whether it's grassroots, uh, new build projects, or uh, unit additions, or maintenance activity. Uh, I, I think it's becoming more and more of a, uh, you know, a, a, a more important sector of the industry because you have facilities that are in uh, remote areas and, and they don't have access to the grid, so they build on-site power generation. That can be seen certainly in South Asia and, and East Asia and, and South America and other places to support mining operations and, and other types of uh, facilities. Another thing that's in, included in this is uh, microgrid systems and off-grid systems uh, that, that may not really be uh, involved with a traditional utility company at all. It may be a group of commercial uh, facilities or other industrial facilities that are getting together and forming their own microgrid system. Uh, data centers, the, the build out and development of data centers certainly, uh, you know, are they're huge energy uh, users, and uh, so we cover that uh, under under this umbrella of industrial energy producers. But it's a big sector of what we cover. If we look out for the next 18 months. We're tracking over $80 billion of activity for all types of projects there. So uh, it's a big sector of what we track, and I think it'll continue to play a major role as the industry uh, continues to transform and we move away from traditional power sources. Mm -hmm. Okay, Britt, uh, that actually brings us almost to the conclusion of uh, the, the session. But before we do that, um, if you could just talk a little bit about some of the summary, you know, the, the major themes, the things that we really should be looking out for uh, before we just jump in and address some of the questions that have come over the web uh, you know, whilst we've been having the discussion. Yeah, I won't, I won't read bullet point by bullet point, but these are just things that I'm often asked about, Shaheen. Uh, Power to X, are we tracking those projects? I, I guess the biggest example I can give of that is where they're using excess uh, electricity from wind farms or solar fields uh, through an electrolysis process to produce hydrogen. Uh, that hydrogen is then used in turn to uh, maybe generate electricity through combustion turbines or it may be sent to an industrial facility that needs hydrogen or to a transportation uh, uh, group that, that burns it in buses or, or other types of fleet automobiles, that sort of thing. Battery storage, a uh, huge, huge uh, sector of the industry. We're seeing more and more of that develop. I don't care where we are, we're uh, around the globe geographically. Uh, we're seeing this play a larger uh, role every day. Uh, other energy storage technologies, pump storage, compressed air energy storage, uh, a number of others that, that we're seeing. And uh, so I just wanted to to mention some of those because I'm often asked about them, and we are we are tracking these, and we see them uh, playing more of an impact in in spending for the power industry as a whole. Okay, and I guess uh, just your summation before we take those questions, um, give me the the top three themes that we really need to be paying attention to this year. Yeah, I think you know the the COVID outbreak has certainly had an impact. I'm not certain it's going to be the end of the industry. I think we're going to move forward. Uh, we're going to get back on track. Um, it's it, but it certainly has played a 
uh, you know, has has put a damper on things for a while. Uh, renewable energy, we're going to continue to see that move out low as we move more to a low carbon alternative. One thing I didn't mention on the emerging technologies, we are seeing more uh, carbon capture projects uh, uh, moving forward as well. So I think I think that's something that we need to be watching out for. Uh, but uh, still pockets there of traditional uh, power generation as well, like the old uh, go-to uh, fuel sources, coal, nuclear. I, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. We're just moving steadily at a steady clip away from those. So um, that, that's where I see us going. So I'll be happy to take a couple of questions. Sure thing. Yeah, don't want to let you off the hook too soon. Now, uh, one is actually just about our research methodology. I know we, we, we constantly make reference to high, medium and low probabilities. Can you just explain to folks what goes into uh, a researcher assigning a particular project uh, a, a rating like that? Yeah, we, we look at a number of factors. Uh, we're looking at uh, the first question that we we really apply to the project is, is it being developed, developed by an established company that has had a long track history of developing similar projects? Uh, do they do they have a, a success rate of carrying these out to completion or is this a startup company? Nothing against startup companies, but the ones that have a track record more often move yeah, so that's one thing we look at. Uh, we're looking at uh, what kind of hurdles are, they're uh, facing from a financial standpoint, from a permitting standpoint, uh, public opposition. Uh, so all these factors uh, go into this. How much con are they competing against other projects in the region uh, to supply renewable energy or, or just electricity as a whole? So we take all those factors into consideration when we assign those. Okay. So uh, we've shown some fairly hefty solar numbers as well. This is another question that just come in. Solar investments, is the trend towards seed SP or is it PV technologies for power generation? Which one? It's, it's uh, the trend is, has been and remains to be uh, photovoltaic PV solar generation. Uh, less less expensive and uh, uh, less expensive, uh, uh, quicker to install as far as a construction timeline and uh, higher availability. And uh, one other one that's come in, it uh, goes back to that um, story we were talking about previously, hydrogen fueled HRSGs, turbines. Uh, do we see this as a technology long term to helping deliver carbon free uh, power. I think so. I think it's going to play a role uh, going coming forward. Uh, we there's one specific project right now in the U.S. Uh, that I'm that I'm thinking of. It's a repowering project uh, out in the western United States where the repowering and coal facility. I think initially they're going to use 30 percent green hydrogen. Uh, eventually creeping up to about 80% green hydrogen in that project. And I think it's something else that's going to uh, play a larger role in meeting our, our future electricity needs, absolutely. All the major turbine suppliers are, are uh, you know, have developed the technology to burn hydrogen, higher concentrations of uh, hydrogen as a fuel. Okay. Well, that's great, Britt. Uh, you worked pretty hard today, so I think we uh, we can let you off uh, now. Thank Many you. thanks for, 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 for sharing your insights today. Really awesome stuff. Thank you. Uh, and and just to to wrap up, I would like to obviously say a very big thank you to today's webinar sponsors, the folks over at Hillco Filtration. Many thanks, guys, for your support today. And um, like all of our webinars, uh, you can uh, go back and listen to this particular session, session or indeed hear past recordings of uh, webinars that we've delivered in uh, you know, this year or indeed last year or there, there before. Uh, but more importantly, we really do want to uh, invite you to come and join us again. We have a number of uh, industry specific webinars which are scheduled throughout the course of the year. So uh, please do uh, try and take the opportunity and tune in. Uh, we very much look forward to, uh, to, to chatting with you again. So with that, thank you for joining uh, and I'll say 
Goodbye. Thanks, Shane.